me, climate change is everyone's issue. Because it's real, it's happening, and it's already impacting on all of our lives. To of climate change into more of a gender specific uh, representation because the burden of the effects of climate change is borne disproportionately on women and more specifically on black women. So, the question I'm an educator from Peter Maritzburg. As educators, there's so much that we want to do with our learners on a practical level. We want to take them out on field trips. We want to work with them and show them South Africa's got so much of resources, but we are just limited to a class, to the classroom. And one of the main reasons for this is because of a lack of funding and a lack of support from the DBE. So, Minister Christy, I'm appealing to you if you could look at some of these issues and afford us that opportunity. So we can optimize the work that we are doing in the classroom. Good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Anjorich from the National Business Initiative. And at the moment, we've been doing a lot of work with companies around transition risk and looking at the issues around a just transition. Uh, we are at the point where we are about to start working with chief executives to start to say what is the long-term plan forward for those companies and how we form a much closer relationship with government that can allow us to demonstrate how we can have an orderly transition to a lower carbon society. Good morning, Minister. Dave Collins from Mac Consulting and the Industry Task Team on Climate Change. Um, the President said in New York in a statement, we will be enhancing our current mitigation NDC by the end of 2020. Could you give us some indication as to how much more onerous do you think our NDC may have to be by the end of 2020? Um, my name is John Clark, uh, and I'm very pleased to see Sir President Ramaphosa's commitment that he's recently made about turning Mpumalanga into a renewable energy source. But what we're going to have to also do there is not just simply go from coal to renewables. We've got to overcome and restore a, a, a century of soil loss, ecosystems destruction that's happened from mining in finding some sort of restoration. Of the the although the global <coughs> prediction is 1.5% increase in temperature, in South Africa that, that is projected to be much higher. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. I'm Geraldine Morris from Business Unity South Africa. I just want to talk more around funding as part of the President's speech. Um, the President did talk about the Green Fund, specifically around ESCOM and the decommissioning of the coal-fired power stations. But the electricity sector is broader than just ESCOM. And there are other players in the private sector that could enhance and contribute to this program. Uh, a lot of emphasis was placed around carbon neutrality in 2050, which needs to consider very strongly how this will be funded in South Africa and who will fund it. Good morning to, to all. Uh, my name is Shulian Rajkumar and I'm representative of Sasso. We recognize that we need to transition and we are committed to transitioning to a normal carbon and more climate resilient economy. When will this just transition can be communicated? The current policy misalignment that we have with regards to environmental, energy, trade, industrial policy. How do we bring all of this together and in transition this economy to one that is lower in power? My name is Viviana von Achtmal and I represent banks. The government is exploring prescribed assets, which is expected will force um, South Africa's pension and other large funds to invest a large percentage of their assets in ESCOM, a fossil fuel burning, environmentally disastrous enterprise. Surely this goes against global ESG principles. 
should prescribed assets not rather include investment in renewable energy? Anyone here today? Because I do see that this is a, a corporate environment. I would like to ask Stage, how then are we going to integrate the youth, young people, and their innovation, their cre creativity towards this global problem that we are facing? How do we integrate our voices within the a corporate space? Thank you. Yeah, my name is Paul Manoleke. Uh, I'm coming from Greater Alexander Tourism and Heritage Association. But then currently, the biggest challenge that we have in our local <coughs> communities is number one, like working relationships with all stakeholders, number one. Uh, Joske River is our heritage site. And then currently, it belongs to national government. We propose to uh, clean the river and turn it into a tourism attraction. The biggest challenge is within the departments, whereby the uh, city of Johannesburg they've got their own uh, programs, the province and the national. And then Looking at thinking globally, acting locally, I've been acting locally in the Thiamadiba community on the Wild Coast for the last 18 years. Hoping that within the two or three years when it started, we'd all be sorted out and this biodiversity hotspot will be protected. It's not, it's now still facing the threat of mining the coastal dunes, disrupting the community, and undermining the resilience of the community. And how can we uh, move into a whole new consciousness in not just thinking globally and acting locally, acting globally and thinking locally? So we talk about inequality on different levels. We talk about inequality from the global north, the global south. We talk about inequality between men and women. We talk about inequality between rich and poor in relation to the effects of climate change. So why don't we use that as an entry point? This is a conversation that is not usually had. It's usually invisibilized. Our and trees are being decimated. I would like Johannesburg's forest to be declared a forest and not just ornamental trees on streets, and it doesn't matter whether they die or live. When we as educators look at the curriculum, we have realized that climate change has not been introduced from an early enough age. It's only subjects like life sciences and geography that address climate change. So we are requesting that if this topic can be involved in more subjects, across the curriculum, if it can be. You also have an emphasis on science and what science has to say. That South Africa is made up of many regions with local communities with indigenous knowledge um, and ways of solving problems at a local level that are sustainable. People whose first language or whose ability to speak English is poor are excluded from these debates. Um, their knowledge then is to use an expression somebody else used earlier, invisibilized. And these are all um, social resources that we have that can make a difference, especially to food security. Trees play a role there as well. My name is Tita Bokolivia and I'm a youth climate activist. I'm here with other youth climate activists that would like to share um, the youth statement that we've drafted. So my name is Tyler Booth, I'm part of the Youth Policy Committee. We call for the inclusion of youth-friendly, accessible mechanisms to create awareness and educate the members of society of the adverse effects of climate change. We urge the government to embrace youth-led, youth-focused initiatives that allow for the existence of voices from the global south. Um, as a developing country who suffered the severe effects of climate change, we urge that global funds such as the Green Climate Fund, the Adaptation Fund and other funds that serve the Paris Agreement be made more accessible to developing countries who are in dire need of their resources. The applauds are ethical for introducing the national carbon tax and appeal to the government to continue advocating for the common practice of carbon tax internationally in order to hold multinational companies accountable for their unsustainable practices. We implore governments to declare climate change as a global crisis. For the sake of future generations, we urge government to, to enhance ambition and commitment made towards climate action. We applaud the South African government on the recent strides in increasing youth participation at international climate change meetings. It must be recognized that simply allowing young people to attend such, such meetings is insufficient. We need to be paid with training and exposure to climate change disclosures and in negotiation processes. 
and in my community they often say Tibela Iparakala and what that means medical is that vaccination is better than treatment. In this context, ladies and gentlemen, mitigation is more effective than adaptation. If the government takes steps now to prevent a further harm to our ecosystem, because because we can't opt to lend the hard way on issues that could be prevented. Climate change is an imminent threat. We are in crisis. Please act now. Thank you. Bearing in mind that adaptation and mitigation work hand in hand. We have believed that the South African government needs to further study the effects of climate change on the most vulnerable minority groups. We urge parties to liaise effectively on issues pertaining to climate change, migration and environmental refugees in order to prevent climate conflict. My theme is technology. We applaud South Africa for the retrofitting of fuel, gas, desulfurization and carbon capture and storage in Kusile. However, we appeal to government to explore more renewable energy sources as means of meeting the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Um, but the problem that I find is that the climate for cooperation isn't in place. There's a great deal of tension between communities around resources and access to resources. Where trees get planted in public spaces, they often get destroyed, they get damaged. People on the ground feel that they are excluded. The emphasis seems to be on what business wants, how business can capitalize on the green economy. Has is what is the relationship between adaptation and mitigation? I was involved with the World Health Organization in the health action and crisis. I travelled around Africa to various hotspots to facilitate emergency relief and how we can build resilience of rural communities against the growing threat. And I've now come to the realisation that we cannot really mitigate. It's all about deep adaptation, finding ways of helping communities be resilient. So I want to just... As such, we recommend that the implementation of clear and decisive policies and collaborations with different youth-based entities to train selected young people and put forward clear expectations that government has these for Good morning. Allow me to acknowledge the senior officials from our department, our diplomats who are present here today, all the CEOs and uh, leaders of business, all the leaders of the non-governmental sector, and those who represent youth and women and communities. So let's start with why was it that I thought it was a good idea to handle this session today like this. And our motivation is that when we handle a session like this, part of the message that we are giving is that this issue is our issue. It's not my issue, it's our issue. And for me, climate change is everyone's issue. Because it's real, it's happening. It's not going to happen in 50 years' time. It's happening now. And it's already impacting on all of our lives. So it's our problem. We have to find a way to solve it. I've only been in the department four months. Feels like about 400 years. <laughs> but one of the observations that one would want to share with you is where we began with John and this slogan of think global, act local. And I think that we've got some very interesting commitments that we have made in the global space and further commitments that we have made even at the UN Secretary General's Climate Action Summit. The big challenge for all of us is how are we going to act local? Because when Paris talks about a nationally determined contribution, we are the nation. 
And we are the people that are making this contribution. So the very urgent issue that we've got to think about is how do we make that contribution where we live? So, if we think that it is our responsibility, and from what I was hearing from you throughout most of the dialogue this morning, that's something you all accept. It's our responsibility. The, the real question you are posing is how do we, get in, how do we all get involved together? Because all of you are doing things, and all of you are doing important things. How do we turn these streams of what you are doing into the river that we need? Now, let me come to this issue that our colleague from Swani was raising. <coughs> Read the environmental legislation, sir. Environment belongs to all spheres of government. We all have power. Read the climate change bill, mitigation and adaptation, and the plans and the contribution to get there is the role of all spheres of government. So I think that what we can take as our starting point is that our legislative framework allows us, wherever we find ourselves in government, it allows us to work on this issue. It's not restrictive policy environment, it's an enabling policy environment. <laughs> it also assumes that civil society, the private sector, organized labor will have to be there. And I suppose that's the issue of the just transition and many of what you have been, what, many of what, much of what you have been raising really relates to this question of the just transition. And I will come back to it. So, Starting point, it's everyone's issue. Second point is that there is nothing in the regulatory environment that exists or that's being developed that prevents all of us from getting involved. In fact, that environment encourages us to get involved. What I think we need a bit of Vuma behind is getting the show going. Um, and that, I think, is, is what I've shared with our team in the department, is can we take that wonderful document that we developed back in the, I don't know when it was, 2006 or seven, that wonderful document called the National Climate Response Strategy. Can we take that document? Can we lock ourselves in a room? Can we say, what have we done? What haven't we done? If we've done it, what was it that allowed us to do it? And if we didn't do it, what was it that stopped us from doing it? And can we then develop a plan to do it? So I'm on the same page as those of you who are saying, let's implement, let's hurry up and implement, and let's hurry up and implement together. <coughs> now, what would be the aspects that we would need to address in order for us to implement together? At the National Job Summit, there was a commitment to set up <coughs> a national, a presidential climate change commission to facilitate the just transition. And in the discussions that one has had with the president, we have agreed that it will be very important 
to start the process of setting up that commission. So we've been discussing the just transition in the workshops that have been taking place in uh, the NDP process, and some of you have been part of that. We've been discussing it in the interdepartmental committees. All of you in your different ways, NBI, you are having a discussion about the just transition. But the point is how do we pull that together and how do we pull it together with the authority of government? NEDLAC have been discussing the climate bill. And NEDLAC came to see me and said to me, Minister, without understanding the shape and the form and the nature of the just transition, we are having difficulty finalizing and committing to this climate bill. Because the bill has teeth. It has teeth. And those teeth are going to affect carbon emissions. Those teeth have the possibility of affecting jobs. And anybody who doesn't think that, that, that it is important that we save jobs in this country and we look at the creation of future jobs in this country, I'm sure they are not in this group. Because what we all understand is that we already have, at official figures, 30% unemployment in our country. And the jobs in coal may be dirty. <coughs> but in Emelahleni, they are the only jobs. And there is not a single yard in Emelahleni, and I walked the streets for three months in that area during the past election. There is not a single yard there that doesn't have an escort uniform hanging on the washing line. And it's important that when we think about the just transition, <coughs> We have to think about those who are currently dependent on coal to live, to put food on the table. But what we also know from the National Employment Vulnerability Assessment is that coal jobs are not the only jobs that are vulnerable to climate change. There are 3 million people in this country who are dependent either on commercial agriculture or small farmer farming. <coughs> Many of those small farmers are women. Many of them are working under conditions where they do not have irrigation and they do not have access to regular amounts of water other than what falls from the heavens. So absolutely, those who are already poor and vulnerable in our society, those who already lead extremely difficult lives, are on the cutting edge of the changes that are coming. Mm. We learned yesterday that there are 430,000 jobs in the biodiversity economy. It's scientific, you can write it down, it took five years to research. Uh, that is equivalent to the amount of jobs in mine. Now, those jobs, <coughs> a few of them are in science and game engineering and things like that. But most of them are in the industries that benefit from the fact that we have biodiversity. Ecotourism, the wildlife economy, the harvesting of indigenous plants, and so on and so forth. And those jobs, as climate changes, according to the report, those jobs are on the line. One of our most successful industries in this country is the car manufacturing industry. 
It is successful because it's one of the industries that exports into the African continent. And it's an industry that creates industrial jobs that are of a, usually of a higher quality than other kinds of jobs. That industry is vulnerable because it's based on the combustion engine. And globally, we know that the way in which the technology is changing. So our study indicates that there are in fact seven sectors of job vulnerability as a result of climate change. And we're saying that because what that means when we start to have the, the just transition conversation is that that conversation is not just about coal jobs. In fact, if it was only about the jobs in ESCOM, it would be a really easy conversation. But it's actually about millions of jobs, not thousands of jobs. So I think that it's, it's very important when we conceptualize the just transition that we start to conceptualize the fact that it's about many, many of the major job sectors in our country and that it's also perhaps about our way of life. So it really does need to be, to be elevated into this Presidential Climate Change Commission so that all of us, with our different areas of interest in government, agriculture, environment, economic development, public enterprises, mining, we must all be pulled in. But those of you who are in industry are important in that discussion. What for me was very interesting in the time that I spent last week in New York was not so much the formal speeches in the summit, but the information and the discussions that were going on around that summit. And the very strong sense that one got in that summit about how the world is changing. About how there are new technologies, how there are new conceptualizations of financing, how there are new areas of growth. And somebody posed the issue, why do we always talk about the economy? Why are we not just concerned about people? And I would say that there's no contradiction between talking about the economy and talking about people. Because what we understand is that building our economy and finding ways to deal with poverty, inequality, and unemployment has to be the fundamental question that we all consider. I was fortunate to meet many of my global counterparts on the sidelines of that summit. And they all told me a similar thing. Growth in our countries is coming from the green economy and it's coming from the IT sector. Now, what that means is that, wh why is it important to realize this? We can't just see the implications of climate change as a threat. We also have to see it as an opportunity. And that's why we need business I think NBI was raising the issue, how do we get business more effectively involved? And I think the answer is that we have to bring business in, as a sector, into the Climate Change Commission. But we have to be saying to business, help us on the R&D side. 
us look at where we can grow new industries. DTI does have a green economy. It's one of their sector development strategies. I have had extensive discussion with Minister Patel about it, and we've agreed to set up a much more formal discussion on that issue. Because under the Department of Environment, we are responsible for three of these, what they call the papisas, the oceans economy, the waste economy, and the biodiversity economy. The biodiversity economy is going quite well, but the other two are nice plants that were developed in nice processes, but they haven't really gone where we need them to go to. So we've agreed that we have to have a conversation about this. But there are many other areas that we need conversations about. The hydrogen fuel cell economy. We need research, we need development, we need conversations. So part of the answer to GIZ is that we've got to work together to find the projects. And in the end, the investments and the projects don't come from government, they, they, they have to come from the private sector. So one of the commitments I've made to Minister Patel is that I will bring some energy to this green economy sector, so that we must get the ball rolling again there. Because you can't talk in theory about a million green jobs. You've got to say where are they going to, where are they going to come from. Organized labor is very important in the just transition. Because we have to address this question, how do we ensure that we don't lose jobs? Now that can mean that you'll lose some jobs here, but at the time when you lose the jobs here, there have to be jobs over here that people can move into. Mm. And that requires a lot of thought and a lot of coordination. <coughs> it's, not a, it's not something that's simple. The just transition has to involve communities and community organizations. Because it's not just formal jobs that are at risk. We were talking about Emma Lachlini. If you don't work for ESCOM in Emma Lachlini, you work for a supplier of ESCOM. So it's a community issue. So communities have to be involved. And we've got to find ways to involve the climate change sector, the non-governmental sector in this process. Because for me, one of the limitations of the NEDLAC process is the NEDLAC process is government, organized labor and business. But there are many of you who are in the climate change sector who are not represented there. How do we get your voice into that process of the just transition. Now, if we can move a little bit, a little bit to this question of when we say that climate change is everybody's issue, how do we get everybody involved? discussing something in the department. And what we've been discussing this week is setting up what we call 
a Citizens Environmental Awareness Index. Now that sounds very academic. But what we want to do is we want to measure the level of understanding of environmental issues in our society. At the moment, 50% of South Africans have never heard of climate change. And most of those who've never heard of climate change are the very people who are going to be most affected by it. People who live in rural areas, people who live under conditions of poverty, and more especially women. So we're doing this, we're discussing doing this index because we want to do public education. But public education has to be meaningful. You have to be able to evaluate, did anybody learn anything through your public education? What did they learn? You know, we've been doing public education for decades. Don't litter. Zap it in the Zibi tin. Uh, all these funny things, you know. I had a, an amazing experience two weeks ago at Port St. John's. We were doing a clean-up campaign. And we were cleaning up on the taxi rack. And uh, we go to the taxi rack, and I've got my gloves on and my plastic bag, and we're picking up rubbish. And uh, I meet a gentleman there. He's a taxi driver. And I'm bent over like this, and he taps me on the back, and he says, hello. So I say, hello. So he says, uh, madam, what's the drink here? <laughs> so I said, we're cleaning up the town. He says, I'm really glad you came. This town was really dirty. <laughs> and he's eating an apple. And so we have a discussion. He says to me, have you seen this taxi rank? It's filthy. And we agree it's filthy. And he says, no, no, you must come more often and clean this taxi rank. <laughs> <laughs> and then he finishes eating his apple core. And I'm standing in front of him. I've got a plastic bag. And he chucks the apple core. So I said to him, hey, what did you do? He says, I threw my apple core away. So I said, but you the one that's telling me it's dirty. Then he laughs. He says, enjoy your day, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the education's not working, huh? It's not changing behavior. And I suspect the reason it's not changing behavior is that we're not thinking about this question of publics. Okay, we're not, we're not all the same. We have race and class and gender and locality and language and all the things that you've been speaking about, age. And we don't, we don't understand messages in the same way and we don't communicate them in the same way and we don't change behavior in the same way. And so it's one of Albi's jobs is to develop the communication strategy for the department and to think about how are we going to take this message out there to other people? Why? Well, the one reason is because we want to change people's behavior. So we want people, if they're going to eat takeaway food, to go to their favorite takeaway food shop and say, sorry, I don't want my coffee single-use plastic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I don't want my burger in a polystyrene box. So we want to change behavior. We'd like our kids to switch off the lights when they leave a room. Uh, my family assure me that that won't make any difference in the world. But I'm told that demand-side management can reduce electricity consumption and reducing electricity consumption can reduce the carbon footprint. So it's the tap with the dash of teeth. Water scarce in this country. 
These are the kinds of things, behavior change. But also having citizens starting to ask, so how do the lights work in this place? Do they go off at night or do they stay on all night? Because it's citizen, it's consumer pressure that is bringing about lots of good changes in the world. So we want to up that pressure. But of course, as publics become more conscious about things that we would like them to be conscious of, they start influencing people like me. So the issue of climate change was in the ruling party's manifesto. No doubt, if there was more of a civil society voice on this matter, it would be in a much bigger size print in the next manifesto. So what's important is for citizens to understand the power that they have to change the world. And so that's something we want to work on, and it's something we would like to work with all of you on. How are we going to mobilize these publics to change their behavior, and how are we going to mobilize the publics to understand the things that they need to do, and how are we going to mobilize these publics to ask us as leaders to do more, to get a better deal for nature, and a better deal for people. Now, that means that we have to relook really at the issue of what we're doing in schools. We are doing stuff in schools. But my view is it's got to be much more thought through and much more systematic. I've already had a discussion with the Minister of Education is open to this issue of looking at the curriculum. Um, but I suppose it's also about, as you said, it's about experiential uh, understanding. And um, I think that's a conversation she and I have agreed that we will follow up. We have a program that the President launched in April, called Good Green Deeds. I would want to suggest that in our process of reformulating that program, because it, it has to be something that we're doing much more systematically. Our country's filthy, we have to clean it up. Absolutely filthy. And all this rubbish is going into the sea, and it's killing our fish. And there are 40,000 people who directly benefit from fishing in our country. So I would like to suggest that whether we are in Alex or Cutley Home or wherever, we need, to, we need to sit down and we need to look at the Good Green Deeds campaign. And we need to see how does it link with the work that communities are doing and how can we show that you could make the Yuxke River a beautiful place? So that we can show other people in South Africa who have heavily polluted urban rivers that it is possible. It is possible to change it. So I'm interested in that and, and the link between that and the Good Green Deeds campaign and I think many of the other community, community representatives who are here, we need to look at the relationship between your organizations and the Good Green Deeds campaign. Linked to that is the, the point that was made on the Expanded Public Works program. It, we, we have a very big expanded public works program. It is very important in terms of the work we do, not just in, in cleanups, but also the work we do in rehabilitating river sources, wetlands, estuaries, removing alien species. But I agree with you 100% who ever made the point that that program needs a, a relook. Uh, because it could be working much more effectively 
than it is. Now, there's been lots of debate here about adaptation and mitigation. We need both. So while we recognize that climate change is actually happening, and we can see it happening around us, and we do need to look at the issue of how we mitigate our carbon gas emissions, we've also got to start to adapt. And I've already explained that that process is for all levels of government and all sections of society. So I don't think we must be putting the one against the other. We have to do both. We have to prepare for a different pathway of growth and development. And I've spoken a bit about how we have to all be part of that. But we also have to... <coughs> we also have to face the fact that it's already happening. And those adaptation plans are very, very important. That brings me to the question of finance. And later on, Marcella is going to share with you what is on the agenda for, for COP25. And a lot of what's on the agenda is Article 6, which relates to the, to the issue of financing mechanisms. And somebody raised, how do we contribute to that? You'll contribute to it later on in the discussion today. But I think the big problem we are facing is that at Kyoto, the agreement was that all countries have to do something, but countries have a differentiated responsibility. And those developed countries that caused climate change have a responsibility to help those countries and those continents that will be most affected by climate change. That was the agreement at Kyoto. And so the Green Climate Fund was set up. And there was initial capitalization of that fund. And if you sit in on the debates of global financing, the developed countries would argue that they met their 100 billion commitment. The question is, how did they meet it? So there was aid. And what we know is that the aid was not for everybody. If it was for least developed countries and for small island nations and not for Africa. And we are considered in that definition of things to be a middle income country. And the debate continues. Should the way in which we have to adapt and mitigate climate change add to our sovereign debt because the only way in which we can get money is through the new buzzword called blended financial solutions which is a kind of a loan so yes there is money out there and lots of it but it's money that comes with strings and lots of them and so, I, I guess the debate is going to go on, and there are countries that have replenished the Green Climate Fund. Many of them are European countries, they have replenished the Green Climate Fund. And we have had money, as South Africa, from the Green Climate Fund. And we would want to go on being able to access that fund and other funds. But it's, it's a complicated, it's not a straightforward issue. And I think what we all understand is, why is the just transition so difficult? 
We're a country that is currently 80% dependent on coal. And we want to change to a different trajectory, not just in energy, but in the economy generally. That's going to cost money. And this economy is weak, and money is in short supply. So there are no easy, there are no easy solutions to this. Yes, as I say, there, there is money available out there, but uh, it's money that comes with strings. And it's important that we have to understand that, and that's what makes this whole discussion and this whole debate very difficult. Somebody raised the issue of loss and compensation. I guess that's something that will also be on this afternoon's discussion because it's also a topic for COP25. How are we going to deal with loss and compensation? We met the Prime Minister of Barbados, middle income country, one cyclone, 200% of the GDP of the country. Suddenly a middle income country that is now not so middle of the income anymore. Very, very serious situation. So how, how are we going to deal with that? And I think that um, it's something that, that really would have to be looked at a great deal. We agree on the issue of synergizing the carbon tax and the carbon budgets. It's an instruction that I've already given to our team that's working on the climate bill. We have to do that. We've agreed that part of what we have to do there is to have a high-level meeting with National Treasury and look at how we, we develop that synergy. We are absolutely agreed on that issue. The independent resource plan, I mean the integrated resource plan, uh, I'm not the Minister of Energy, but I can share with you that it's currently before the Cabinet subcommittees. Normally what we do is once policies have been through Cabinet, they are then released to the public. My understanding is it's been through public consultation. Um, my understanding also is where the Minister says <coughs> it's not final, what he, my understanding is what he's saying is we're living in a, in a dynamic world. And uh, we may well want, we may, we may not say this is the, the IRP for the next 300 years. That uh, we may well have to, to look at, I don't know how often they revisit it. Two years. Two years. Two years. Well, that's what he means. Uh, so, yeah, if it gets revisited every two years, then what, that's what it means. <laughs> Somebody raised the question, how do we keep our ecosystems intact? Um, you would know that yesterday we released the, the National Biodiversity Assessment. If you haven't had an opportunity to have a look at it, I'm sure it should be, is it on the website, Alvin? It's on the website. Please have a look at it. Because it's a really, really, really interesting piece of work. And I think what's really, really interesting about it is that it directs us very clearly to where we need to move in terms of our protected areas expansion strategy, where we should be targeting our activity in terms of our walk, working for water, working for wetlands. Because one, the major finding, um, apart from the fact that one in, 20, in 23,000 of our species is, vul is vulnerable, is that our freshwater ecosystems are the most vulnerable. So it really helps us, and that of course in a water scarce country is a huge problem. 
And what it, it's also saying is that those ecosystems, because they are under so much pressure, can't provide the ecosystem services that we would want them to provide, and that are so crucial for, for mitigating things like climate change. So it's really helpful, because it directs us as to where we should be operating in a very minute way. So we have to take all those environmental working for programs and we have to say, okay, let's overlay them with what the study has told us about the systems that are under threat. So that those programs must be working in the systems that are under threat, not working somewhere else that might not be so vulnerable. So that is part of what we're going to do. Um, it's already influencing planning policy, water policy, so it's something that uh, other key departments are already drawing on to inform the way in which they are making their policies. Colleagues, I may not have answered each and every one of your questions, but I hope that what I've been able to share with you is an overall approach to where we want to go to with these burning issues. As a government leader, I very much believe that partnerships are essential. The difficult challenges and the difficult issues that we face are not something that we as government can tackle on our own. So I'm very glad that I've had the opportunity to meet you. Some of you are meeting again. Some of you are meeting for the first time. But the assurance that I want to give you is that I will spend the time that I have in this portfolio first of all to make my contribution to driving the just transition and to making sure that in that process we develop the partnership that we need to move forward as South Africans. The other commitment that I will make is that in all the work we do, we will try to work together with you, not in opposition to you. And I believe if we do that, because we don't have all the answers, we don't have all the resources, and most importantly, we don't have all the time in the world. And I believe that if we do that, and we work together, in four years' time, we can be proud of what we achieve. And we can say that we've gone a distance, and we can hand the baton over to other people to take us a further distance. I hope you'll be committed to be part of that partnership. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening.